Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Legislative Action Day for Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails. My name is Gina Hugo, and I am the chair of the board this year and next. So I'm happy to have you all with us today. And I'd like to start by doing a round of introductions. So I am actually from Sherburn County, so I'm from East Central Minnesota. And that's where I work for Sherburn County Parks. And I'll just um, first go around the room and then I'll have Brad go around online. And if you could um, tell us your name and where you're from, that would be awesome. So I'll just pass it to my right. So I'll start with you, man. Hey, I am Ann Pierce and I'm the Parks and Trails Director for the Department of Natural Resources. And I actually grew up in uh, Hennepin County, Minneapolis. And now I live in the center. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Joe Chernesky, the Assistant Plan Coordinator for the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission, and I'm based at the Liberty. I'm Josh Boss. I work for the City of Elk River as a Parks Fund, um, also on Little Pond Peas and Mille uh, Lacs Valley, their city council. So, um, again, it kind of asked me to be involved with this group, and I've been here for six months to be. Yep. Like that so, so Josh is on the board representing District 4. Yes. Renee Madsen, Executive Director of Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission based out of Duluth. Thanks everyone for having us here today. There's also copies of the 2023 Policy and Planning Report available. And if you don't have one of the Mountain Bike Development Standard Guides, uh, there's a few copies here. And of course, they're available I'll be happy to mail them to anybody who needs them online. Free, no charge. Good morning, everyone. Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner with the DNR. Um, amongst all the other duties, I coordinate our government relations activities. I also work with the divisions of fish and wildlife and enforcement and our tribal relations. Anything else, Bob? Thanks, Bob. Keep your Brad Harrington with Rock County Parks and Rec. I'm also on the board of Greater Minnesota. I'm Sarah Weed. I'm the Parks Operations Coordinator for Stearns County. I'm Carlin Ziegler. I'm the Olmstead County Parks Director. I um, grew up in Marshall, Minnesota, in Southwest Center, and now I'm in Southeast Center. And also a commissioner. Yes, <laughs> yes I represent District 6 for the commission as well. Uh, Jennifer Williams, the Agriculture Commissioner. Elizabeth Wayne, Full Clarity and Hood. I'm the longest, and I guess we're just supposed to mention where I'm from. I'm originally from Wisconsin, don't hate me. There was some I'm from the St. Croix County as well, but live in St. Michael, you know, right now. I, I, I'm a mountain biker and a rock biker, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm doing the 52, what, 52 hike challenge this year. Oh, good. Oh, they can get you some regional and state parks. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We'll go to online. Online. So we will start with Linda and Rosa. Linda Phillippe, Rosa County <laughs> Commissioner. Thank you. Go over to Trevor. Trevor Pumnia, I'm the executive director at the Northland Arboretum and uh, past Park and Rec uh, director. John? John Jibber, Cloud County Parks and Rec Manager, and I am the District 5 board member. Uh, Mark? Mark Kahn, City of Mankato Community Development. Jeremy? Uh, good morning, uh, Jeremy Bartosh, Jackson County, Minnesota, uh, Parks and Trails. Mary Jo. You're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Uh -huh. All right, and then I know, Mary Jo, if you can get through, just butt in. And then we have Tyler who is on as well. Tyler does not have uh, speaking capabilities. I guess he's been permanently muted by people. <laughs> not by me. So but he's joined us too. Mary Jo, I think you're coming through now. Can you hear me now? I was partially in my earpiece and partially on my computer. So Mary Jo Knudsen, City of Owatonna. 
That's everybody. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so we're gonna start this morning with our guests from the DNR, uh, Ann Pierce mentioned, she is the director of Parks and Trails. She's been in that role since 2022, but yeah. actually has been with the DNR for over 25 years, I believe. Yeah. Um, really strong background in natural resources and um, in basic species management. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, and then Bob Meyer, um, as he mentioned, is assistant commissioner with the DNR, um, is in charge of Fish and Wildlife Enforcement, and you said Tribal Relations? I work with our, yeah, I'm not in charge, I'm the Tribal Relations Director of Enforcement. Okay, all right. And then you also coordinate all of the government and legislative activities as well. So sounds like you're a busy guy. Yes. <laughs> We're excited to have you both here. So thank you for taking time um, today. Um, we look forward to hearing about your legislative priorities for this year. And I just pass it to you, whoever wants to start. Do you want to start with legislative priorities? Oh, yeah, why don't I start or... kind of really broad and you can be more specific. Okay. Yeah, best use of the time. So thank you for being here. Thank you for everything you do. It, it's great to work. The partnership that we have, especially the three-legged stool, right? Mm -hmm. Metropolitan mm -hmm. you know, DNR and DNR here. So because the systems all fit together. All roads lead somewhere, hopefully north of the road. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just great working with you guys and the partnership that we've had. A um, couple of our big priorities this year, obviously bonding being one of them. I see the, the support you have, and actually thank you for dropping some bills that support those positions that are our local trail, regional trail grants program and the body bill. Hopefully we can maintain that and get that across the finish line. But also the, the DNR package is a little over a hundred million dollars in the governor's recommendations with more, most of that 70, almost 72 million for our natural resource asset preservation, which covers everything that we kind of manage, right? Not only things in state parks, but also trails, bridges, buildings, infrastructure. So we have a long list of priorities. We like to keep it as a, a programmatic approach just to allow us flexibility on spending those dollars. As we all know, getting work done, contracting, getting bids is, is almost a it's a challenge most of the time it's mm -hmm. a right? piece of work or art or art form to try to do that. So trying to Make sure that we have the ability to move those dollars around and critical to be able to spend those dollars in a timely fashion. So bonding will be critical for us. We have a couple of other bills. I know Andrew talks specifically about some of the park stuff, but one of the bigger things we have is we're moving to an electronic licensing system that will be on your phone. Okay. Be an app that you can buy, um, but not buy that you'll get, and then you can buy your own licenses and register your. Uh, recreational vehicles and things with that as well. So to do that, we need a little bit of an implement, in, implementation language. A lot of it is just changing terms. So if you think about how our licensing system works today for hunting and fishing, and you, uh, a deer, for example, you harvest a deer, you have to notch a paper tag, attach it on the animal before you can move it, and then you have to register that animal either online or at a local facility, local um gas station or something it'll all be done on your phone now but the words tag and register are scattered all through the statute we need to change that to validate so now you'll harvest an animal or a fish and you'll validate it on your phone basically take a picture that'll do all those other things for you so trying to get that done um we also have some exciting language uh talking about game fish dealing with native rough fish so like blue horror, some of our native fish that were classified as rough fish, which in the day it was classified that way because they were sold in the round, not clean. So they called them rough. Um, but many people think of rough fish as common carp, invasive carp, and things like that. So we're actually going to protect those species and in the future put some seasons and limits. So. Uh, people are pretty excited about that. I think we may be the first state in the nation actually to do that. So some of those things like that are kind of fun to work on as well. And then obviously legacy, um, the outdoor heritage fund, I'm not sure. Um, I don't think anybody's sure about anything around here. Yeah. What I hear, but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, where they're gonna go if they they will look at spending some of the, the funds that are on the bottom line now because of the forecast. And, but we'll find that out, I believe, next week, at least in the Senate. They're going to start with the Yeah. On Thursday, I believe. 
other than that, just trying to survive. It's just trying to deal with other people's ideas we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you to Elizabeth for your help with the high voltage siting bill that would have allowed the, the use of our recreational trail system to, to install those facilities underground, um, which would have been a problem. I'm just leaving it to Uh And I'm going to turn over to Anne so we have time for questions. So I'll just say that Specifically to Parks and Trails, we always have the lands bill, which is a big bill for us, um, adding and, and um, removing some things that we need. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. And then we have really technical fixes, I would say, for the other things. Nothing um, that's specific about Parks and Trails other than in the body that we're doing. But um, most of what we're looking at are technical fixes to some things that we have with easements on trails and um, some of the stuff that we need to just make sure works in a system like a statewide system. So as far as those priorities go, we're working on that and things seem to be going relatively smoothly and um, excited to move forward with the legacy and <clears throat> the um, LCC and our work that we're looking at. We're looking at doing some bison stuff as a project and that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of exciting. Um, and um, one of the fixes that we have is actually does have to do with bison, which is to make sure that we ran into an issue this year where our herd is very important genetically. It's mm -hmm. one of the purest, it is the purest herd, bison herd in the country, and it's important that we keep it that way. And so we have to do surplus animals because if, if the numbers get too high, it stresses that and starts to falter the genetics of the population. So we do surplus animals and we have been wanting to work with a group that works with um, tribal communities to help them get bison as an indigenous food source, but also to help them um, ranch and grow bison. And this would be a perfect opportunity, <laughs> but it ended up that we had to, do some fixing in our in our um, statutes so that we could actually get the bison to them. So that's one of the things that we're doing. So we can kind of move. They're managed on. under state drug pyramid law. So we had to do <laughs> with Paul Law and the prior administration. And so we'll see our technical fix to the bill and our policy to yeah. go with that. It's, it's interesting. So we ran into it. <clears throat> South Dakota could not take them. We could not give them, and it was this kind of tractor. But we're going to get fixed, so that's that's very useful for us. Um, but as far as our priorities for uh, the parks and trail system, um, at, on the ground coming up in the next few years, um, as you know, there was a, a large um, appropriation in the Get Out More funding. And the whole department is really working on that and making sure that we're working and engaging with folks to make sure that we're identifying those sites that are highest priority and that we can um, really look at modernizing what we have. Because as you probably all know, and some systems are different than others, but for the state system, it's pretty old. And we're looking at really relatively big needs from, you know, accessibility needs to um, getting people so they get their permits on, right? That kind of stuff is <clears throat> really needed in the state park system because it is an old system. And so we are working right now to identify those sites. We have a few, a large pot of money for public water access sites, and we are working with all of our partners to help identify those sites that are in highest need. Um, we have another set of money that's really looking at state parks systems and making sure that they're accessible. And you know, one of the examples I give is, um, and this is not a state park, that's not one that we're looking at, but it's something that I think about when I think about what we need to do with this money is that we have Cayuna, which has a great accessible trail but the campground, shower, and bathroom facility is not that accessible. Mm -hmm. And so that just doesn't gel, right? We need to think about that as comprehensively. So we're 
working through a lot of what those priorities are going to be. It's a large pot of money. It's a really a great opportunity. Even though it's a large pot of money, it's going to only go so far, but we're hoping that we can really do some things that highlight what a modern system would look like and you know, say if we can continue to do this, we can really make sure that all our parks and trail systems are accessible for everybody in Minnesota. Um, the other piece of that um, accessibility piece that we're looking at is making sure that everyone in Minnesota has access to our state park system and that they feel comfortable and safe in that system. And so we're doing a lot of work with that. We have some money that we're focusing on really looking at um, reaching out to underrepresented and underserved um, populations. One way we're doing that is looking at our ICANN program, which is really a great program, but it's been mostly focused on families, right? So parents come with their kids to participate in that program. And some of the things we're looking at is reaching out to groups and school organizations to reach out to kids and places where kids are in groups and they go out and do some of this stuff and learn about how to camp and how to fish, how to do other things. And so focusing on um, groups that we can work with to really um, get information out to make sure that we understand what the needs and of the population of Minnesota is and how we can best meet those needs and make sure that everybody really has those unforgettable experiences, right? And then pass them to the next generation and you get to create a lot of the outdoors and outdoor recreational systems. And so those um, are some of our highest priorities coming forward over the next um, year. And then just some specifics that we're thinking of because I want to leave enough time for us to ask questions, but um, of course, we are working on the Upper Sioux Agency State Park transfer, and um, we we will continue to work on that. We have kind of the first half of that stage is going to be completed um, in the next few days, and that's very exciting. There's another stage of that, um, which we have to complete by the end of August. But the other piece of that, and we've actually been talking to a little bit about this, how we can help move some things forward is one of the things that there were some funds appropriated to help us transfer the park and get through that system. And one of the things, the bulk of that money that we're focusing on is really trying to find recreational opportunities in the area. And we went through this summer and late fall or early fall, a public input process. So we had a series of meetings in Granite Falls, um, invited the public, invited all the local units of government to those meetings and really just asked them, what are your ideas? So what's out there in this area that you um, would like to see um, enhanced or looked at for a recreational opportunity? And we got a very large list of things that were out there. We also had a online opportunity to engage in that. And some of the things we realized is that maybe there's a potential for some of the, the two counties and possibly the city to become part of this system. Mm -hmm. And so maybe part of that is to help them get to that point so that they can engage in that. Um, and we have a large list right now. And what we're going to be doing next, in fact, our uh, Laura Royce, who I'm sure you guys are familiar with, um, has been reaching out again to the local units of government, and we'll be starting some public process again to say, okay, this is a huge list. So let's try to narrow it down, maybe think about some short term goals, and then think about maybe some long term goals, and then look at what type of ways we can get those things funded um, in a variety of different ways. So that's a really exciting thing, and I'm really <coughs> grateful <laughs> to this group for um, you know, helping us engage in that process. I think it could be really good if we can um, get to a point where we have um, them a part of this group, which would be wonderful. But so that's where we're at with that. And that's gonna continue to be work that we're um, looking at. And um, the other thing um, 
that I just wanted to touch on was kind of how we all have been working together along with the Metropolitan Council. And, um, you know, we've been engaging in a variety of areas when I just mentioned, but I think the other thing that um, as we move forward with some of our capital investments that we have, we want to engage and make sure that there are opportunities where if there are systems that are being worked on in greater Minnesota, especially like trail systems, where there might be a spur where we can make sure that we can connect a state and a regional trail, whatever that may be, that we're engaging in that kind of conversation and understanding where those needs might meld together. And that would likely be from our regional staff who obviously have a daily relationship with the folks um, in the regional um, parks and trail systems. And I think, you know, another thing that I'm very excited about is the arts and art thing that we're working on. I think that's going to be a really interesting thing. We can't wait to see what it produces, but I think that's a really great opportunity for partnership and kind of getting that seamless system idea. And the hope is, I mean, I think we all three of the partners in this want to make sure that as a state, we have this kind of seamless system so people understand, um, you know, that we are all working together and there might be different services provided in different areas for different regions, but they kind of have a really good understanding of where those are and where they can find them and make sure that, um, you know, that those trails go from one to another so you're not like, trying to go down the road that is not that safe just like, get over there to that trail and those kind of things so i think it's a really exciting opportunity for us to make sure that as we move forward in the future we can learn from each other I mean, things that we have done separately and make sure that those can build on each other as we as we move forward so Thank you. Thank you, Thank you both. So and, and you're absolutely right. Us working together is hugely important because people using the facilities don't know if they're in a regional facility, a state facility, or a MET facility. So um, having them um, um, coordinated is really just beneficial for all the users. So yeah. And we, we have um, a couple of questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've got a little bit of time yet. So um, our first question is a question that we've been talking about for a long time um, with the Greater Minnesota getting 20% of the legacy mm -hmm. funds. It's been our goal to really maximize the amount of that 20% that gets out on projects. Mm -hmm. And with a portion of it being used to cover the administrative costs, we'd really love to see that administrative costs come from a different source so that the entire 20% of legacy funds can be used to grant to um, the facility the greater Minnesota. And um, just looking for ideas from both of you on helping us overcome the challenge of getting in the governor's budget as the commission is not a state agency. Yeah. Um, so is there a way that we could get in the DNR's um, budget for the administration fees or something is there a way that we could get something for that from another source? What's your suggestion? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I recognize we've been talking about that for a while. Yeah. Um, we'll start working on budget stuff here soon um, in the next couple of months. I think continuing that conversation, talking about internally. Yeah. What does it look like? Making sure the governor understands it. Um, and then just trying to see where's the Met Council or the Metropolitan Regional Partners. I think that's where some of the challenge comes in, right? I mean, yeah, I think that part of the challenge is there is that the Met Council is an actual, they're an entity, you know, right. and they are a cabinet level. Um, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're cabinet level, whereas the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails is just, it's an entity unto itself. It's not really, it's not an agency. It's kind of this quasi thing. So we don't have any input on the, the governor's budget. And 
you know, and so it's so in and in, in, we don't have the ability to raise taxes because again, it's this loose conglomeration. It's you know, our this full time staff is actually on contract, so it is kind of a weird thing. But that all of that comes out of the twenty percent. So, so what is that number? What's the administration number? Nine hundred fifty thousand. Yeah. So four four five. Yeah. And so it's just trying to, and everybody's always empathetic. We we came as close as we have been last year. You know, our he'll be coming in in a few minutes for his awards, and the house shall really push hard. We do run into not surprisingly problems in the house, but we think that if we can come in and in the governor's budget, it will make it a lot easier for us to make that case. You know, and I'm sure every single one of these folks here could tell you what they could do with 425,000 as a legacy award. A lot yeah. of <laughs> yeah. I, I can't guarantee anything except that we will continue the conversation. Okay. I mean, it, it's really important for mm -hmm. us to do that. And, mm -hmm. and as we work internally to put things together and, and talk about things, we'll uh, make sure you guys are involved as well. Thank so, you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thank you. Hi, welcome everybody. Hi. No, that's okay. But no, that's okay. Um, just take a seat, and um, we're almost wrapped up with this section, and then we'll go on to the next part of the agenda. So, um, so we just talked about the fact that park users, trail users, don't know if it's a state trail or a county park or what they're in they just know that um the dnr probably takes care of it or if i ask um the county parks director she'll know about that city park that mm -hmm. happens all the time yeah. mm -hmm. and so we get um, people coming to us with concerns about um dnr facilities who's the best what's the best advice for our members to give to to concerned people about state facilities uh, so um just want to clarify what the question is um is it like who can you direct them to yeah okay thank you um i would say if if you're in a regional area and you know who the regional manager is just direct them directly to the region okay. of the region so like if you're in um, Stearns County, and we know that um, Mark DeRieger is the regional manager for Stearns County. Just direct them to Mark DeRieger. Okay. Um, or, you know, Ben Verde up north, and that would be probably the, mm -hmm. just the most direct and quickest way to okay. um, get them. Because no one wants to call the winning center never. No, I mean, that's <laughs> not like it. Yeah. the map with our regions, yeah. we put contact names and yeah. numbers yeah. on there for you, yeah. because our regions are some of the throwing counties mm -hmm. like in region one when you would think it'd be region, things like that region sure. too, but. That would be a helpful resource for yeah. you. Yeah, and I can send it to you, right? Uh, don't send it to their legislature, because then they're not being. A question I got from a right. county commissioner yesterday that was yeah. like, this state trial in, our, in my county is breaking down, and they keep contacting hmm. me about it. What do we do? Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. appropriate to send Yeah. Them. Okay. It, what trail was that? William Munger? Again, it's on my list. <laughs> okay. <laughs> exactly where those roots are. Was that yeah. Senator Barrett? Um, I don't even know. This was the, there. it's one of our members, like oh. the county commissioner who's like yeah. on our, very active on our community, or on our membership committee. And she's just like, what do I do, Liz? Is this, can I get, can I get legacy funding from you guys? And I'm like, well, no, it's, it's a state trail. Um, But uh, yeah. you can try and help <laughs> to figure out who to go to next. Yeah. So, um, and I think for those local kind mm -hmm. of contract contacts, the, mm -hmm. the regional manager will get you the names of them. Yeah. And probably this. Yeah. Hey, and one thing, if I can do it. Of course. So when you talked about connections to the parks, it's yeah. funny because Joe and I were just at in Marshall yesterday yeah. looking at the trail that's going to go around Marshall. It's a great trail. Mm -hmm. And it comes up to Canada State Park. And there's a section mm -hmm. that's mold trail through the park. And ideally, you know, they love to see something like this happen in the park because it's going to connect up this great mm -hmm. regional trail. Uh, and what it meets the requirements for us to do the things that connects the trail center and the park goes through the state parks. It's perfect. 
And I know you have a long list of needs, and I, you know, obviously that's not probably the rise to the top. So how can we help affect those conversations? And we talk about, you know, how these, and it's a small section trail, they're all not right? So right. Like, you know, right. got a drawer full and you grab it out and you're hey, this trail. But is there a way we can work through this so that we're part of those conversations? Because we know what's coming through things like up to Maple Woods State Park. We've had great success with that and another part of the place. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of those things that tie together in the systems that would make just a really seamless experience for yeah. trail practice. Yeah. Trail practice. Mm -hmm. And I think um, for the bonding, that's those kind of trail projects are more of the bonding we need right now. The trail projects that we're doing to get out more money are more like um, making sure that their surfaces are flat enough so that they're accessible. And so it's not like, um, it's it's creating the accessibility that may not be there. They're pretty short mm -hmm. little places that, that we're doing. Um, but I think definitely, and I can work with um, writer Will, who is our new um, section manager for that, and work with him and have, you know, we can think about with Laura, think about how we can connect on those larger projects. And I think what it is, is thinking about ahead of time, getting them into the queue, right? And that's the piece that I think we need to do. So that was long queue. Yeah, but you, you mentioned Maplewood, right? That was a great success story. Yeah. We're the center of fashion and local friends groups, yeah. and the state, yeah. and parts yeah. of trails. Yeah, I mean, there was some, some sighting challenges and some work to try to figure out it in the park, but there always is. But I think it's getting done. Yeah, well, we should so. probably pull that up as an example. Yeah, of right. where right. systems can yeah. work together. Yeah, and make things happen that are great right. and realize the cost efficiency, right? And the problem, yeah. Is well, it's, 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 it's an extreme section. You don't right. want to be on a trail and then run it again, right? right? So, right. and so I think that might be the process is that we get Will in here to be introduced to you. He doesn't be probably day to day you, but um, and get those ideas in the process as we start to create these proposals. And then there might be a way to work with the local elected officials to help yeah. get the spur that yeah. Yeah. our body is really wide and having more specific right. Exactly. <laughs> well, thanks to everyone and thank you for your time for being here today. Um, you're welcome to stay. Um, but if you have, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'll be able to do my 11 o'clock meeting, and I already started my meeting by more by day. <laughs> yeah, we never talk. No. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so so now next up on our agenda is um oh you want to introduce me yeah do you want to introduce who you are <laughs> welcome thank you um i'm here i feel like creating community and we want to get regional park development for we have a whole system of trails that we've been working on it right so people with us for free today so um, I am Heather. I am a student from the University of Minnesota. Hi, my name is Wyatt Ashby, and I am also a student from the University of Minnesota. And I'm so Kelly Allen, the director at our local community and youth center. So we're very involved with the trail system mm -hmm. and the, the youth out. And these two are currently even tours on the upcoming trails that are going to shut up for spaces. So we've had a severe experience for them. So yeah, so thank yeah. you for traveling all the way here and um, being part of this. So thanks for your work, too. Appreciate it. Um, so now we have with us um, Senator Grant Coastchild. Thank you for coming. And um, we're excited um, for you to be with us today because we have something for you. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Liz, who's got a few words to say. Yes. Okay. So a little less than two years ago, Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails 
was very saddened to learn that our two biggest champions of the legislature weren't going to be there anymore. Senator Bailey Rexon, who had been really instrumental in ensuring that Greater Minnesota received a portion of the Parks and Trails legacy fund, was retiring. And Senator Kerry Rood, who many of you know, who have been our strongest supporter on legacy issues, general fund, and so multiple members were coming to me and saying, Liz, what are we going to do? How are we going to handle this? Little did we know that six months later, an even stronger champion would emerge from the North Lake. That champion is sitting right next to me, <laughs> Senator Grant House Chet. Two years ago, the now then Senator was a city council member for a GMPT member of her team and was the executive director of the Senate Foundation when he announced he was going to run to fill the very large shoes of Tom Bach. A lot of people thought with Bach on that that seat was gone from the Democrats and that uh, this guy didn't stand a chance. That district had long been trending in a different direction and his opponent was a very popular mayor and one of the best known realtors in that area. But in the campaign, we all started to see somebody who was politically smart and a hardworking champion. And on election day, he emerged the winner with a thousand vote margin, which is actually not a bad size, helping his party secure the majority as well. A couple weeks later, Renee, who stepped out of the room, and I were discussing who would be who should we have carry our joint legacy bill? And she suggested Senator House Child. She knew him because, well, you know, everybody in Duluth knows each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, she, she has a really small area. Like really so, uh, she happened to carry our bill with that, you know, a new champion for Parks and Trails and Greater Minnesota emerged. But the story didn't end there. Shortly after the session started, we saw that Senator House Child was carrying a bill that changed the lottery in Luth Marmula. We spotted an opportunity and reached out to him by text on a Sunday morning. You know, not the best time, but you got to do what you got to do. So, but the bill was being heard, and we asked him if he could use his legislation and his efforts to help increase the amount of funding for Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails. Didn't hesitate a minute. Sprung into action, and within 24 hours, the wheels were in motion. It wasn't an easy job. I'm not going to bore you with everything he had to do, but he brought passion and political smarts to the task. And it was, but it took until the last minutes of the conference committee in May that he helped ensure that Greater Minnesota received its first dedicated funding source for regional parks and trails outside of legacy. And that's not all. He helped ease master requirements on the LCC and Margo. He fought tooth and nail to try to get us funding for the commission. Now, though we did not get that last year, it really set us up well, I think, for next session, as we heard from our conversation with the DNR. He helped push back on bad legislation that would have hampered our ability to build parks and trails and more. Again, we need to emphasize the most remarkable aspect of all of this. He was a freshman legislator when we did this. This was his very first legislative session. We don't usually see that level of dedication, and more importantly, that level of success of a seasoned legislator. And that's why, for the second time ever in our tenure history, we are going to be giving away our Legislative Champion Award to Senator House yeah. Now I'm handing it back to our chair, Gina. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you want me to follow that. <laughs> okay. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, your work is so important to our members. I mean, it helps us as park managers make the outdoors accessible to Minnesotans and people who visit our state. Mm -hmm. um, so Thank you, and we're excited to give you this award for your work to support what we do. But I mean, just thinking about talking about you today, I wanted to like kind of sound like I knew what I was talking about. So I looked at the list of bills that you authored, and I'm I'm blown away. I mean, there's clean energy, housing, education, natural resources, um, the whole gamut. So thank you for your work for Minnesota. And with that, um, we'd like to present you this award. Thank you. Oh, it's nice. We're being pretty happy from that uh, portion of the state and the rest of the Okay, and uh, our official photograph here. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, you guys. This is just uh, an honor. And um, so I, I, I'll i just say a few short words. Um, I get the privilege of representing uh, the largest and most rural district in Minnesota, uh, but it's also, I think, the most beautiful. Uh, with that said, to our crazy uh, neighbors, uh, my, my uh, longtime family cabin is in Ottertail, uh, and I grew up in Fargo, so I drove through crazy every every weekend. Um, and Minnesota is special in that regard, right? No matter where you go, we have outdoor recreation that 
pales in comparison to any other state. Um, and I think that's what makes Minnesota really special. And when we're in these negotiations in the legislature, I always want to pinpoint that Minnesota wouldn't have a lot to chirp about if it wasn't for greater Minnesota and the outdoors that we provide. Yeah. Um, if it was just the urban center, um, you know, we wouldn't be what we are. And so when we're negotiating these big bills, I always want to make sure that we're taking into consideration the rural communities, our outdoors, our recreation, our opportunities. And the best part is every Minnesotan and frankly the world gets to enjoy these opportunities. Um, and, and you know, because I represent so many rural communities, you know, I think this not just the the action of creating these trails, but just the symbolism of connecting our communities, I think is really powerful. Um, in northern Minnesota in particular, we have a lot of parochialism on the Iron Range between the North Shore and Duluth. And what these trails have done, the Munger Trail, the Masabi Trail, all of these trails have done is made our communities that much more connected. Um, and it creates that sort of artery for all of our region to be together. And when people visit, they get to explore so much beyond what they normally would. So getting this dedicated funding was a great first step. We're not done. There's so much more to do, but I just so appreciate what you guys do locally uh, in, in making sure these trails and parks happen. Um, and happy to be a champion for you all and uh, can't wait for the next idea. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Um, do you want to say just a few words about your legislative priorities for this session? Certainly, yeah. Um, you know, that, so this session, I've really been trying to highlight what I see as the biggest challenges facing our rural communities um, and trying to focus really on the bread and butter that, that matters economically. Um, I have a lot of challenges with people wanting to live in northern Minnesota where it is so beautiful and we have trails and parks and all these things, but they can't find the housing, they can't find the childcare, they can't get the broadband, they can't get all of these things that, that people take for granted in, in the suburbs and in the cities. And so what I've been focused on is um, uh, a childcare affordability bill and a subsidy for childcare centers to open up. Um, EMS, uh, ambulance services in our rural communities is, a, is in a crisis mode. And so I have an emergency aid bill for that. Um, I also am trying to expand the low density broadband program so that it reaches more of our ultra rural townships that can't afford, you know, what they need. Um, and I have a township aid bill that would be the same as LGA and CPA, that same proportion increase for townships. Um, so those are, I, I apologize that I don't off the top of my head have yeah. like the environment stuff in my, in my head of the park stuff, but um, but really kind of trying to focus on the biggest needs in rural communities and try to highlight that for my colleagues. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day Thank to, you guys. to be with yeah. us. Yeah, really appreciate the opportunity. And yeah. like I said, excited to hear what else we can do. So yeah. I mean, some of the other questions you can have. Yeah, please. Okay. So um one of the things that you carried the bill last year, Fall Power Amendment, um, was trying to get, you're just talking about this with the Dean on. Funding, dedicated funding for the commission. And yes. so we're already thinking ahead to 2025. Yep. What suggestions do you have for us as an organization to start setting those wheels in motion now? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, I think um, mm -hmm. making sure that the DNR is, I mean, having those conversations, mm -hmm. making sure they're they're aware. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to work on Senator Herr, right? Okay. The chair yeah. of the committee, making sure he understands this need. Mm -hmm. um, the committee is very metrocentric. And so how do we kind of, kind of navigate that and make yeah. sure they understand the need for the commission funding. Mm -hmm. um, we did that kind of last year with mm -hmm. highlighting what the Met, Met uh, gets versus what yeah. greater Minnesota gets. Um, so let's keep thinking about that. But okay. yeah, definitely. And I'm not, and then also just bipersonally, right? I'm yeah. Or whatever we need to do, if we need the votes across the aisle, happy to yeah. help foster those relationships to try to do that too. Okay. Um, so what can we do as an organization to help you and other legislators move towards our goal? 
you know, I think highlighting what you do is mm -hmm. like the best thing you can do. Okay. Making sure that rural communities understand like how this happens, what you all do. And I know you already do that. It's amazing what you guys do. But anything we can do, anything I can do to like amplify what I'm in communities about about this work, I think would be the most effective. And then if we can try to create, uh, you know, um, I'm sorry to go on, on a tangent, but it's like, when it comes to environmentalism or uh, business, whatever these groups are, they get these like armies of grassroots people and like flood the legislature with advocacy. Mm -hmm. It would be awesome if we could create mm -hmm. that type of coalition. We foster those relationships in these communities in greater Minnesota, they would. Yeah. Like people want this. There's no doubt. Mm -hmm. They just need to be told like, what they need to do to organize to 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 tell the legislators. So, um, I have a couple other questions. So this is not a trick, but uh, <laughs> so there's quite a you have a great resources in your district, but uh, quite a number of designated parks and trails in your district. Can you name any of them? Gucci. State. Oh, designated the regional oh. parks and trails. Here, Masabi. Is that the Masabi? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
I will admit uh, that I, I'm not directly involved in that um, and not exactly uh, kind of sure of what the angle is, but but happy to explore it if that's a, yeah. yeah. And that came from Trevor with uh, more from Dr. Reed. And I will follow up with Trevor and find yeah. out um, what, because I'm not familiar with what's going on. Is it all <laughs> well, what I'm wondering is, is it the possibility of trying to open up bonding or funding mm -hmm. to nonprofits versus government entities which has kind of been expanded this last time Trevor we'll let you into that yeah. yep all right thanks yeah so there's been a, a greater push obviously um, a lot of the funding goes to the metro areas uh, they provide about 40 percent of the services get about 60 percent of the funding um, right. so the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits is doing working it's eerily similar to the Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails Commission where they're trying mm -hmm. to expand services you know reach further into the impoverished counties um, you know, hmm. I'm in Crow Wing County, so, um, you know, Brainerd's obviously one of the, the hot spots that they've identified where we're trying to secure more funding. And it's not just for, um, you know, parks and trails, though today's meeting is. I was just curious if you were involved in that process. Yeah, I, I have not been being a part of, so I uh, would love to explore that further. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? How are we on time? Yeah, um, quick question. So obviously we brought our young people with. Yeah. And this is all new to yeah. them. If you had advice to give kids about, um, they're the ones who are using the trails, people bring their families to use the trail hunters, um, on how they can get engaged, what advice would you give them? That's a really good question. I think legislators love to hear from, or policymakers, everybody love to hear from young people, right? You guys are our future. Um, so writing letters to your local legislator, um, showing up, like doing this kind of thing while you're here, maybe meeting with your legislators and telling them about your experience and how important things like bonding are, like Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails, those things are, are tremendous assets for you all. People want to hear from young people. So don't don't shy away. Be be active. Yeah. Agreed. I think everyone in the room is delighted to see. Absolutely. Yeah. We're here to see it's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we know you have sessions. Yes. So again, thank you for stopping by. And for all you do. So we hope. Uh, you well, honored to, to receive it. And thank you guys so much yeah. for, for the Great. kind words and for the support. Thank you. All right. Thank thank you. You. Yeah. Uh, to get a picture with you. Sure. Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Do you want to just talk to me? Yeah. Another one? What? It's like official photographer. Yeah. Something to get that for our. Uh, yeah. We'll get one for our new yeah. 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 I don't know what I'm saying. 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 I don't know what i am saying Appreciate all your work. Yeah. yeah. And the support. So it is fine. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Anne. I really have to say about an hour ago. Yeah. Hi, Anne. Hi. 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 We could have had the tip paper time. We can still do it. Don't worry. When you're going to the lobby, if you're going to be with anybody, that should be the first question you have here. Look at your last segment. What's your favorite pie? What's pie? Anybody that answers a mud, that's the one we want for the case. Okay.
All right, we're, we're in the agenda we are. Okay, yeah. now so we'll segue into um, Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission. Um, and we have Renee Masson and Joe Chesky with us um, to give an update. And I'll just pass it to Renee, Executive well, Director. Thanks. Um, so take it away, Renee. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, a really good discussion today. It was nice to see Bob and Ann and mm -hmm. Franz Oski. And all of their comments were a product. Yeah. Oh. It's uh, it's an uphill battle in Greater Minnesota, just based yeah. on who our legislators are. So yeah, you know, it's great to have Grant on board. Um, we're really pushing for it. So a couple of things um, happening. First of all, again, say a copy of the guide at Route 11 and policy piece. Pass them around. Um, just thinking about what we've got going on. So um, as a little bit segue into. This past year, we were able to award um, the number a lot of grant funds because we had that extra million dollars in lottery. Um, it's a holdover funds. Yeah, please. Thank you. So we ended up granting for a little over $16 million for this coming year because we grant each year of the land. We don't do it all at one time. Recognizing the projects always pop up um, and there are needs. This year, uh, the supplemental funding, uh, the, as you all know, the, the tax collections came in at greater than anticipated, which is a wonderful thing. And Senator Hostile's carrying a bill for our extensions for some projects that just ran out of runway or are running out of runway. Um, but as well, we're taking the supplemental funding request on behalf of all of the funding partners. So they will all benefit if we are successful. And the reason we want to get those funds is because project costs keep escalating. So it's better to get those dollars in this year by any rather than waiting until until next year. And because the projection is greater and greater than anticipated, it came out of about nine million dollars parks and trails funds. So our 20% of that is significant. I don't mean rather it's third, but it's what it is. So we're going to have clearly some additional dollars available for granting. Um, we all also recaptured some dollars from the grant that didn't need them all. Um, we're looking, we're still working with DNR, your 2.5, uh, your administrative question to the DNR actually kind of touched on that. Uh, we pay the DNR 2.5% off the top of our appropriation to administer grants on our behalf. And that is in a biennium about six hundred and seventy-nine thousand dollars in this biennium. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. You've seen high amount of dollars. Um, so we're in active communication with them about figuring out how we can get that fee down to something more in line with LCCMR, which is a fixed fee of two hundred and sixty-eight thousand dollars per year of band, which is still a lot. But bear in mind they do three times the number of grants that we do also. So we're talking with them about that, and we have recaptured a little over $24,000. They agreed to initially not charge us for the administrative. So bottom line is there's going to be a little over $2 million available for an additional granting period that we're going to release sooner. We're waiting until next year if we can get these additional yeah. supplemental offers. So think about that um, in the context going forward of um, projects that may be coming up quickly, but also connecting people with the outdoors grants. One thing that we've been asked in the committee the past two years, and it came up again when we had our presentation last week at the was um, what are you doing to make rental equipment available on free use days so that people who don't have the dollars or maybe the interest in investing in outdoor equipment can try something? And we've given away um, quite a bit of money in connecting people with the outdoors grants, and we're going to continue to do that, obviously. Um, by the way, they love to attract wheelchair information, and we, we talked about it in the committee last week. Um, so moving forward, we hope to get some requests in from all of you about equipment. Yeah. Many of you in this room have taken, you know, you made those requests, and we want to continue to do that. But it's going to be tied to a certain number of days that need it to be made available at no charge because these are public dollars. 
uh, and we should be giving more opportunity to those underserved communities that we don't recognize are out there in all of our areas. So that's something that we're going to be talking about um, with the commissioners at our March meeting. You know, just what does it look like and how many reuse states it would be? Um, because the thing to remember there is that it was a pointed question coming from the committee. And thus far, I've not seen the Met Council or DNR respond to it. They're running away from that as fast as they can. We, on the other hand, submitted about a two-page memo discussing what we would do, what, you know, what the plans are to make sure that that equipment's available. Um, so that's dollars that we hope um, we'll see on the new requesting to be able to get those that equipment to the parks. And again, um, you know, a couple of years ago when we did that first round of CBO granting, um, we were hoping for some really out of the box weird ideas. And, um, we, we didn't get there, but you know, we're still hopeful of that. And Representative Lily Alex holds this up as a good example. He said, you know, I asked about how that program went. And Ms. Matson said, as well as we hoped. He said, I never hear that from TNR or the council because they don't talk about how things may not work out well. But we were able to go into some discussion about what did work well. But you know, the honest truth is, we all know if you try something, it doesn't work. So you have to keep trying and keep getting those dollars out there. Keep hoping for some really good ideas that we can share amongst all of us. So, those are some of the things um, that you'll be getting updates on going further, going forward. And then Elizabeth did ask me to maybe address something too about the tribal partnerships, the tribal governments. Um, that was a statutory change that was made to our legislation in the last um, last year, in the 2023 session. Um, instead of just including city and counties in our designation process, it's cities, counties, and tribal governments. Um, as well, there was uh, a comment in there about working with nonprofits. We, you know, we, we work with nonprofits. You all do, you know, with programming to come through your park. So we're not really sure what more specificity there can be other than we're just going to continue to do that and look at opportunities. But as far as the tribal governments go, Joe and I had um, a meeting uh, with the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council and their leadership and their May meeting. And we're hopeful to be able to continue the discussions so that um, those entities are treated the same as their cities and counties and able to have designations uh, for parks and trails on tribal government lands and probably in a lot of cases line up with parks and trails on the other side of, of those tribal governments. You know, we know one in four a has a trail there. So um, that's what's continuing to happen and uh, we are addressing that and we're glad for the opportunity. But before I Take all the air out of the room. I want to all slow down. <laughs> talk because I need to get my hands pressed. I was like, man, if I couldn't talk with my hands, I don't know what I do. <laughs> on the phone, I go, yeah, you just go right down there and then you take a right and it's around the corner. <laughs> Which is always interesting when she's the one driving. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking around, you know, so can sometimes she's driving, it's just me short. Three hands, three hands, three hands. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, we're having a great time right now. We're in a bit of a cycle with a lot of designation application requests and as your plans coming in, so we're on the road again. Uh, it's turning out to be a busy spring in that regard and just Hearing a lot about new facilities, a lot of collaborations going on, a lot of work to get pursued, uh, state turn back that's going on, trying to identify some additional resources and trying to be a part of that. Uh, but I think the thing everybody probably wants to know about is this year's hunting cycle, uh, which does open up on April 1st this year. Uh, we were already in talking to a lot of folks who are interested in applying this year. Um, before that opens, before the end of the month, we will have our website updated with all the new uh, criteria and uh, all of the new regulations for this year's application, as well as tutorials and everything else that we normally do. Uh, the one part that we really want to, at least I want to really try and emphasize is those, um, the, the funding that we're trying to make available, or at least the process for uh, environmental uh, process Projects. So if you need to, if you're looking at a park or future project and you want to sort of get those shipple processes or environmental views or anything like that out of the way before you apply for actual project dollars, you can apply to us for a special grant just to do that sort of work. 
We know that the dollars have been increasing to complete those types of projects. They're more complex, they're taking longer, may present potential roadblocks to getting projects done within our typical timeline. So we're really encouraging folks to take advantage of that. You can apply for up to $15,000 of legacy funding required minimum 20% local match. And that can sort of help you to set yourself up for better success on future projects. Get a large area or maybe a complete part taken care of. And then you just got that process done when um, you come to us for funding. So that's an opportunity for all of you, especially in the final like crazy is where you've got a blank slate. Uh, it might be a great first opportunity just to get some of that and that too sort of looks like it might be a rolling grant. So there was discussion around that not being tied to an April 1st start date, but having a pool of funds so that at any time of the year, those environmental uh, review grants would be available. Yeah, to that would be a huge benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Because then when you think of it, yeah, you yeah. can just go in and apply. So it help us to make that open and um, a more reliable source of funding by applying for it so we can say there's demand. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, it'd be really great. So, um, other than that, um, do we have any questions for anybody? Or? You mentioned the equipment. Yeah. I'm kind of doing free. I'm kind of curious are they dead set up free or is there a certain pressure? We charge five bucks easily. It's free. very, very, very nominal. So, I just didn't know. It's got to be. In the spirit of what was being asked, I know that's not right. Yeah, that's yeah. Fine. <laughs> but we understand also that you know you have to charge a fee so that you can continue to maintain and replace that equipment. That's important. But what's been tied to it is make this equipment free for X, free and available for a certain number of days. And it's not going to be like six. No, it's or maybe we'll have to get to do that, but. No, it's going to be a certain number of days. I don't think it's going to be onerous. And, you know, it ties into those, you know, it's probably going to tie into promotions you're doing anyway. You no, know, I know that you're all going to make special promotions to get people into the parks and offering things that are going to charge. So that's the perfect way to tie it in. Just let us know so that we can shoot it out to those legislators who are asking and say, here it is. Here it's working. We're doing this. And, and here's the picture of people in Jamaica. And then with that too, that also would kind of help for us. All our equipment was purchased before this is all. Yep. Would they still want to see that happen with the equipment that was purchased before these stops happen? So we'll go retroactive or how yeah. will that look? Because that I mean it's not a big deal where I'm just trying to think through planning and how we do it in more resources. No, I don't we haven't really discussed whether we make it retroactive. We probably ask people if it's possible. Right. But that wasn't the stipulation on the grant was given. Yeah. So, right. Well, I know our plan with oh, okay. um, our connecting people to the outdoors grant, our partnership grant between um, Stern, Sandy, and Sherburn, um, just got off to a rough start. Um, I think it's I think it's going to be great. Right. To do with the weather? <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> but. When we were ready to order the skates and snowshoes, there was none to be had thanks mm -hmm. to COVID. Mm -hmm. And then now that they're all here, we've had no snow. Right. So it's a <laughs> rough start, but it's really going to be great. <laughs> yeah. 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 We are really excited. So so next so. week is probably going to be one of those overwhelming. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. still excited to have April snowstorms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it helps. It is only May 1st. Yeah. We've got a lot of them. Um, I do, I do have a question. Um, it's kind of, um, me thinking ahead. We are applying for, um, a grant through the DNR to, uh, purchase land, um, that does have a perpetual conservation easement already associated with it. Would that ever affect, um, the designation application at all or? Is it an already designated facility or no? No, I don't think it would. Okay, no, perfect. You've got little parcels like that in other parts. Yeah, there's yeah, if it's something we haven't seen before. That means we probably don't have a policy. So we, okay, we call it the strings kind of like parts. Yeah, <laughs> I like that idea. Any questions on line, Brad? I don't see any in this card. 
always if there's anything we can do to help you. Right. Well, you know, it's a partnership right? I mean, it's pretty seamless. We try to be always responsive. One thing I'll say about the commissioners is that if something's we've tried isn't working, or if we listen to the feedback, which has happened and changed formulas for granting numerous times, we try to fix it because it's not our dollars, it's state dollars that are supposed to be spent widely and distributed widely. And uh, I will say that the commissioners are always responsive to what they hear from their constituents. So, you know, the state government in many ways has run as effective ways to put it. So I think being this quasi <laughs> sort of entity that we are proves that we don't need um, to be under a state of uh, to operate effectively and, because we've got really good partnerships together with the facilities. One other question that I have, yeah. when you're talking about the nonprofits, probably government those things. I'm not 100% sure of the language, but I'm just kind of curious. The process is still the same. So, that in really, a conservative program and look at the funding, they've got to be a real investment. Yeah. That would be one of my fears is that a nonprofit would look at and go, hey, we want to do this program. Let's go a lot for legacy funds. But if you don't have a reason to designate the facility to operate with that, yeah, so that's that's just one of those things. I didn't know if that language had appeared, whether it would say no, it's got to open up if you're not. And no, from my standpoint, I'd probably be wondering no, that's, that none of that changed. It's it's still we're gonna have just with the bottom audience as far as yeah, not that we're talking about I'm all for more people having access if they're going through the proper channels. Yeah, yeah. It's still following the designation process mm -hmm. laid out. And as far as the nonprofits, it was a it was a strange sort of throwaway sentence that just simply said. Continue to explore opportunities to work with us. Shall Any other questions? Nothing online? No, we're ahead of schedule. Nothing wrong with that. But um, yeah, so we're, we're going to segue into tips and tricks and lobbying. So, okay. You want to do a bathroom break? What kind of bathroom break for those online and uh, and those here? If you want to go to the bathroom, it's around here somewhere. I'm going to grab coffee. So oh, and choose a lobby bed in front of the bathroom. <laughs> take another. In five minutes with exciting updates and big asks regarding our legislative agenda. So,
grab like the handouts we have on the logging day. Did you get them down there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. Because I'm going to be referring them while we're talking, and then everybody online should have them as well. I would sit down, and I'd like to speak standing up, but I'll sit down. <laughs> you're good. Got you. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, if, however you're comfortable. Okay. Now this is fine. <laughs> so, um, thank you, everybody. Uh, and, um, very excited to have you here. Um, y'all know me, Elizabeth Wakel. I'm a lobbyist. And uh, we want to talk about a number of things today. We're going to talk about the legislative dynamics, kind of like what's going on this year. We're going to spend some time talking about what we're asking the legislature for. And then we're going to talk about how you do it. And so talking about both what you should be doing today, but also kind of like going forward. Because um, politics and policy and the legislative work is a relationship game. And so... It is great, and we're very excited again. Like we're all excited how it's been here, and it's about time to start. But politics in the legislature is a relationship game, and so it is not something. It's not like a one-time deal. It's not just show up on legislative action day. It is about building relationships, about a lot of factors like that. So we'll talk about that as well. But let's talk about the legislative session. Um, so. You know, Minnesota legislature operates on a biennium system, and the first half of the biennium, the odd years, that was last year's when they do the budget. That's why we spend a lot of time in the odd years on things like legacy, because that's when they do the, the budget. Even years is the traditional bonding year. Now, I say traditional because if you've been watching the legislature at all for the last, I don't know, last eight years, they have not been doing a good job of doing bonding when they're supposed to be doing it. I won't bore you with every single time they've screwed the bonding bill up, but as you may recall, they passed what should have been our 22, 22, or our 2022 bonding bill in 2023. And so this is supposed to be a bonding year. We are hoping that there will be a bonding year, if nothing else, to get us back on schedule. I think what happened with a lot of projects, a lot of water projects, a lot of parks projects, a lot of things got delayed because they didn't get the bonding built at the time. And when there's delay, there's higher costs. So there are some legislators who are like, oh, we don't need to do a bonding bill this year. We did one last year. It's like, no, we need to do it this year. It's not going to be as big as it was last year, but it is really problematic to the local governments, to the state agencies who are trying to get projects done to build that. And um, just as a reminder, what I mean by bonding, that is money from the state. They take out bonds. You know, like taking a loan out back by the full faith and confidence of the state of Minnesota. Um, and so we, we need to do that this year and we need to get it done. It's going to be a challenge for the legislature because there are billions of dollars in requests. The DFL today has said we want to get this done. Mixed messages from um, the GOP. Uh, yesterday, my colleague and I met with uh, Dean Erdahl from um, the Dassel area. He is the minority lead in, this, in the House on bonding. He very much wants to get it done. They still get it done. Senate's probably more of a wild card. They were the wild card last year. They'll be the wild card this year. That's why it's important to all of you to make sure that your legislators know we need a bonding bill this year. So, you know, I think it is and not just on parks and parks. We need it for a lot of reasons. So as you're talking to your legislators, I know that just geographically, a lot of you do have senators who are going to be in the minority. Very important to remind them because that bonding is unique in that it requires a supermajority. So you need Democrats and Republicans to pass the bill. Remind your senators particularly how important it is that we get a bill done. So um, just a couple other things just more generally. Um, so, you know, we have a surplus again this year. I think, honestly, I've been doing this for 15 years. And when I started lobbying, we used to have deficits. And so there was a lot of panic around, like, how do I keep the state from, keep, you know, cutting the funding that they're giving me? Well, they made some, you know, changes to our tax code and things like that, you know, um, almost a, a decade ago that has put us towards surpluses. And we're almost getting, I don't want to say, two accustomed surpluses. We have a surplus again this year, not as large as last year, and it's not a budget year, but I expect we'll see some attempts to spend some of that surplus. We also have challenges that if you look down the road, they are predicting we potentially could have what's called a structural deficit. They don't know that yet or whatever, but that's some of the dynamic here. Um, the other dynamic I want to mention is, is that typically, in addition to being called a bonding year, this is often referred to as a policy year. Again, things have sort of mushed together over the years. It used to be, again, when I first started lobbying, they really focused on getting finances done in the odd year and policy and bonding done in the even year. Now they do policy all the time, but they do have to have deadlines. And so 
Deadlines are very important because that's when they need to get their work done. And usually we have what's called a first and a second deadline. So it means you have to, if you have a bill that is policy, that means you're not asking for money, you're just asking them to pass a law or repeal a law to do something or other, it's policy. Typically you have a first deadline, which means your bill has to get through all the committees that need to hear that bill before the first deadline. Second deadline, the same thing, but it has to happen in the other body because you have know, the House and Senate. This year, because it's a shorter session, they combine that deadline. We have one deadline, and that is next Friday. So if you're wondering why I have bags on, under my eyes and you're getting emails and texts from me at really odd times of day, it's because most of us are working around the clock. Um, but we should have a better sense by next week of at least where policy stance. And I say, should have a better idea. There's a lot of things. Those are de There's deadlines and there's deadlines. Things like the bonding bill, those deadlines don't apply to them. So some of the policy issues we're going to talk about even though they're a policy issue, will probably be discussed beyond the um, that date. So um, different things happen, so. Um, but I'd like to talk then about our priorities. And so this is, a, again, of the handouts that you have. We look at the 2024 asks. Um, this is a, what we're gonna be talking about next. Now, you'll notice if you are if you are intimately familiar with the uh, GMPT's 2024 legislative agenda, you'll notice something's missing from our ask, and you'll notice that the LCCMR bill is not on there, and there's a specific reason that it is not on our asks. Um, so one of our priorities every year is to help make sure that the LCCMR bill gets through um, for two reasons. We have been historically pushing over the last decade to ensure that there's money for local parks and trails grants in there. And then also we usually have at least two to three members who have projects. We don't push on individual projects, but we are very supportive of getting that bill done because we know it'll be a different member every year and that's important to our members. The reason it is not on our legislative ask is because unlike some of the problems we had sort of in that 2018, 2019, 2020 timeframe, we've actually been able to get the LCCMR bill done. And so the House has actually already passed their LCCMR bill. It has over $5 million for um, local parks and trails in there. And so I think we can take that as a win. We've you know, been supportive, put letters in and things like that as it's moved along. We're just waiting for it to get off the Senate floor. So at a minimum, we know that we will be seeing at least $5 million more for those local parks and trails grants programs. So yay us, all right. Um, <laughs> but that's why that's not on here. This ask refers to what are we looking for this year and what we need you to talk to your legislators about today, tomorrow, and next week. Um, and so I'm going to walk through those asks. The first ask is bonding. And so um, Bob Meyer you know, uh, referred to this a little bit, but there are several grant programs. There's the Outdoor Recreation Program. There is the Trail Connection Program that are for projects that aren't eligible for legacy funding. So this might be a, you know, a trail that connects a city park to a neighborhood. It might be something that connects your city to a state park or to a regional park. Those are local trail connections. Outdoor recreation grants are even broader and they are, um, and actually this handout, this other handout talks a little bit more in depth about what those are. So you might want to refer to that, but um, you can just even see on the back you know, some people use it to develop campgrounds. Some people put in ADA equipment. Some people put in boat launches. There's a lot of good projects that get funded out of them. Those are matching funds that go to our cities and counties and sometimes townships um, to do a lot of really good projects. We find, you know, we really have made a concerted effort over the last decade to support putting more and more money into those programs because, quite frankly, we know a lot of our GMPT members. Are never going to, you know, never going to qualify for legacy. And even those who do, I'll use Rochester as a classic example. Rochester has a couple designated parks, but they have a whole bunch more parks that are never going to get legacy funds. This program has helped them. You know, you're just talking about Elk River having 41 parks. I'm guessing the majority of those aren't eligible for legacy. This is really important. In Frazee and other areas, these grant programs are extremely important. Um, to our community. So we are there to help put forward the money. So this is, um, and I'll talk a little bit at the end about some of the talking points, but this is probably our biggest ask this year is trying to get, you know, funding in the bonding bill for this. The governor did include $2 million in his, in his proposal for it. We think there should be more. We're asking for four. We're hoping maybe they can settle somewhere in the middle. But again, 
The Metropolitan Council gets a lot of money. This money goes to the entire state, but we have fewer programs we can access. So it's really important that we put money into these programs. So that's ask number one. Ask number two, I'm going to be honest, is a little bit more technical. Renee was talking about it a little bit. This is a Senator House Child Bill, and then it actually has a, um, a representative from Woodbury who is carrying it for us. And the reason you're like, why would a Woodbury legislator carry it, care about us? Um, one of the challenges we run into in the House Legacy Committee is that it's all folks from the Metro. There's one or two um, Greater Minnesota legislators on that that are from um, Greater Minnesota, that are from Greater Minnesota, that are Republicans. Um, we could have had a Republican carry it, but um, they were being a little sometimes goofy about what they want to carry. So we're like, Representative Chow, would you carry this for us? And he was like, by all means, he pulled on a couple other Metro legislators. So this is one of our strange bills that's mainly being carried by metropolitan legislators, and that's okay. We'd love to have some more greater and some legislators on there, but um, basically that bill does two things. As Renee mentioned, legacy sales tax came in with more money than we expected. We'd like to be able to grant that out earlier because, again, in inflationary times, the sooner we can spend that, the more bang we can get for our buck. There's also extensions. As all of you have probably experienced with COVID, projects have been delayed, supplies have been delayed. And so not everybody's able to get everything done as quickly as they would like. So we're doing that. Um, so any questions about those two things? I have a tendency to just talk and talk and talk and talk. What so, would happen to that additional funding if this bill doesn't pass? So if this bill doesn't pass, and so what will happen is, is two things. So the additional funding that has not been allocated out will be pushed forward towards next year and will get allocated in the next biennium. So part of this bill is just about allowing us to spend it earlier. And again, in inflationary times, we think that's a good idea. Honestly, the more important thing that we need to get done is the extensions, because if we don't get the extensions done, um, that money goes back to the Parks and Trails Fund, and then it gets redistributed under the 40-40-20 formula, which means that that million dollars that was ours is now 200000 for us and 800000 for the other two entities. So it is extremely important I mean, the best thing you can do, and again, we're hoping that as we get further beyond the pandemic, this won't happen as often, but it does happen. Sometimes your construction crew can't show up. Sometimes, you know, weather happens. And so sometimes you just can't get it done in time. So it is extremely important to us that we get those extensions because again, we get so little money, we wanna be able to use it all. Um, we are working longer term and and I are on a solution where if that money doesn't get used, we can funnel it back out to greater Minnesota, other greater Minnesota places, but we haven't been able to achieve that from a policy standpoint yet. So that's something I'm hoping it's part of next year's legacy bill will get done. Well, I think we've all also felt that there are still supply and chain yeah. issues. Yeah. Yeah. It's issues that, I mean, it's still happening. Parks and Progress get only mm -hmm. really yeah, we keep telling folks, legislators have some believe it, some don't. That was what had problems mm -hmm. with our house authors and why we have Metro legislators doing that. The more we explain to our legislators how things work in the world, the better off we all are. So I I have a question going. You mentioned structural deficit. Can you explain what that means? Sure, we're gonna get really wonky here, guys. Okay. As policy, especially for the high schooler. Keep this in mind, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna get wonky. Okay, so the state every year has to do its budget. Unlike, say, the federal government, Minnesota, we cannot operate a deficit. We are not allowed to. So if it starts, so basically, deficit means we have, we're making, we're spending this much, we're taking this much money in. This amount that we're spending is less than what we're taking in. That is not allowed to happen in Minnesota under our constitution. So if we are spending more than we think we're taking in, but basically what ends up happening is they cut spending off and they have to make decisions about where it's not getting spent. So an actual deficit means, you know, we are staring down our bills. We don't have enough money to pay them. What a structural deficit means, the way the government um, sort of budget works is that um, in law, the state establishes standing appropriations. And so these are appropriations that sort of, this is where we expect to be spending. So there are some things that don't need to get renewed. I'll use local government aid as an example, um, or county program aid. Those are actually written in the statutes. And so we don't need to pass a bill every two years to fund LGA or county program aid. 
that's funded. Um, there's also um, a lot of other funding that's like that where we don't need to pass it every year. Other types of funding, um, I'll just use an agency, for example, we do have to appropriate it every year. The DNR gets part of their budget paid for through um, uh, you know, the general fund. And so when they come and try to, try to keep it not too lucky, basically um, there's an amount that is expected that the DNR will be spending every year. And sort of when we do our budgeting, it's sort of set at that base level. And if the DNR needs more, when we come in and redo the budget, then they add more in. But looking forward, looking ahead, what the what our budget office does is like, okay, we've got all these appropriations that are sort of set up in statute or that we know happen every year, projecting out that amount of spending is more than we are expecting to take in. And so just project out four years down the road. And what they're looking at, at least right now, um, the amount of money we expect to spend is going to be more than what we will take in. Doesn't mean there will be a deficit. It means there could be a deficit. Some of the challenges, particularly, probably not as much with say the DNR, but with um, the biggest chunks of the state budget, like health and human services, um, the Department of Education, sometimes it's hard to predict how much they're gonna spend and they end up not spending all of their budget. So when it comes, when push comes to shove, we don't have that deficit. But sort of as things look right now, if we only take in as much money as we're projecting and we spend as much as we're gonna, we think we are, we will be in a deficit. One of the reasons we are also looking at that is kind of a strange it's a political thing. Um, before my time, I wanna say it was back in like 2002, Again, the state bylaws required to do these budget projections every maybe twice a year. Um, the the they have to do not only the current budget but the out years. The state was coming together and putting their budget together, and this was a bipartisan agreement. We had a Republican governor and Democrats controlling the legislature. They're looking at the out years and they're like, "Oh, if we pass this budget, you know, we're going to have a deficit." And the reason they were going to have a deficit is that they had included inflationary projections into their spending. And so what they did is they passed the law so they didn't need to include inflation in their spending, but they left inflation in their, um, in their income. And so basically you had all these budget forecasts where they were pretending expenses were flat, but revenues were continuing and the expense growth. So it was a political thing. And it was, you can't blame Democrats, can't blame Republicans. They came together on that and agreed to it. So last year, Finally, the legislature said, we got to stop lying to ourselves. We have to you know, acknowledge that inflation is a real thing. So they included inflation. So that's why we're seeing a potential deficit. It may not happen. We may do that. So we don't want to say that we have an actual deficit. We won't know until like November and February of next year. So sorry, that was really wonky. Does that make sense? Yeah, <laughs> that explains what a structural deficit is. Thank you. I'm getting that right. Then when we have... Um, excess money to spend mm -hmm. the worst thing they can do is put that into programming that creates appropriations in the future because then those appropriations would be harder to i would say i would say it's it's not what i would say worse it's a politically challenging thing if you put it into mm -hmm. an appropriation that is ongoing and honestly that's part of the challenge when that we've had in terms of getting funding and if you look at what happened last year the state spent a lot of money, but they called it one-time money. It was money that you weren't automatically going to get after. It was last year, understanding that sort of political scenario, they they did it as one-time appropriations. So um, that has been one of our challenges, I'll be honest. And that is why we really, really need to get the GMPT into the, or the commission into the, the, yeah. the governor's yeah. budget. Yeah. Um, so a good question. Any other questions on structural deficits? Sorry, I wasn't expecting the answer to that one. All right. Uh, no, it's a good question. And honestly, it also, again, politically explains part of the reason it has been so hard for us to get an appropriation for the commission. Yeah. Okay. So um, the last bill I'm going to mention, and I will be, honestly, I'm going to write an article about, about this and we're going to send, spending, sending it out to all of our members because I think it has broader ranging implications than I think the Senate, the author, especially the Senate author, even 
understood, but there is a bill that's being heard today at three o'clock in the Senate Capital Investment Committee. Either myself or my colleague Bradley Peterson will be testifying against it. Um, and it is the Capital Project Replacement Fund. And basically, this proposal would require that any time a local government, so county, city, township, receives money for a capital project, that means where you're building something, you know, that you would have to establish a fund to pay to replace that project sometime in the future. So if your local government receives money um, for bonding money, and that honestly, I'm trying to find out, but there's a potential, it would apply to even these grants, that if you receive that money, you would have to establish a replacement fund, which could only be used for future repairs or maintenance. There's a lot, I mean, I shouldn't have to tell you the problems with it, but there are a lot of problems. And this is why I'm making this explicit and asking everyone to start talking to their legislators about it. Um, you know, whether it's your bonding project or whether it's a grant program, local governments are already providing usually a 50% match, sometimes more, um, you know, and when they receive money from the state. And, you know, though that state money, it's a local partnership because local governments don't have the same means to raise money as the state. You know, at the end of the day, local governments are created by the state, but they also tell us how we can raise money and how we can't raise money. You know, generally states, local governments can raise money through um, their their levy referendum. And so basically establishing this, you need to have to establish a, a levy referendum or every park and trial out there in the state, again, put bring back us, we have to start charging admission. That really goes against our sort of goals trying to make parks and trails more accessible to everybody. It's just a terrible idea. So if it passed, property taxes would likely go up to pay for pro projects that would not even happen. Um, I think another thing we need to remind legislators is that when, if a local government is asking for funds, it means they need the help. They can't do it themselves. We're limited in how we can raise money and don't have as many options. I'm going to be honest, my fear with it is that the likely result is that only the wealthier cities and counties will be eligible for state funds in the future. And does that cover the DNR Parks and Trails grants too? Or I, we don't know yet, but I, my reading of it is that yes, it would cover the DNR Parks and Trails grants. And, and so, I mean, honestly, this would create a system of have and have nots. I think we heard the earlier question mm -hmm. from Northland Arboretum about trying to, um, you know, get more money out there. You know, for better or worse, one of the things, you know, I, I, I try to remind, you know, that all legislators are good and bad. And sometimes I have to remind greater Minnesota legislators when they complain about some of the spending that happens in Minneapolis or St. Paul, I have to remind them, like, who do you think is paying for your bonding? And, you know, I mean, in general, apart from, say, you know, Rochester and Rochester, you know, Washington, greater than maybe you know, you know, I mean, even that, you know, greater Minnesota just doesn't have the same financial resources that the metropolitan area does. That makes sense. Um, greater fund, whatever, does it take a percentage of fund? They, what they do is they would leave it to the MMB to create, to say how much money you need to do that. And it's also problematic because a lot of times I know when you do parks and trails, you're cobbling funding together. You're getting a million dollar grant from here. You're doing, you know, got a grant from a foundation over there. So it could be a $10 million project. $1 million of it is actually from bonding. You would still be expected to establish a fund to replace that entire trail. Can you give an example of a pseudo town, a pseudo project, that, mm -hmm. and how it would affect it, that, that town? Okay, I'm gonna use like I'm gonna <laughs> what's what's your project? Uh Wanigan Regional Park in Gracie. And if this was in place, we would not have a regional park. Mm -hmm. um, we do not have the income in our community or the population to have anything that would be gone. <laughs> I mean, and that's a that's a great example. I mean, it is, you know, you're trying to establish that, that park, you're trying to, you know, use different sources. Um, I can think of another example. Well, there's a hypothetical fictional town called Yellow Wing, and Yellow Wing just found out recently that they are no longer able to use the county's public service building. And so they're not going to be doing it this year, but next year they will, in all likelihood, be coming to the state to have get some funds to help pay for a $20 million building that they weren't expecting to have, and they sort of under state law have, have that building. And so they will likely be asking our legislators for some bonding. 
So the, to pay for that, Yellowman would likely ask for, let's call it $20 million building. They'll ask for $10 million to pay you know, from bonding. They will raise the $10 million through their local, some of it will come right off their property taxes, but in all likelihood, Yellowman will go off in the bonding market and they will sell bonds that the city has to pay back. But what this bill is saying is that, okay, Yellow Wing, in addition to that, you know, $10 million in bonds that you're going to be paying back over the next 20 years, you also need to establish a fund so that you are setting, you know, however many, you know, millions of dollars a year to replace that. Because when you have to replace it in 20 years, which they may or may not have to do, it's going to cost a lot more to replace because technology changes, costs change. And so they are essentially going to be paying out of their property tax level for two buildings rather than one. So I think that honestly is, is a pretty simple way to explain it. I think we've got a great example too. Again, you know, a beautiful city, you know, growing population up there along Highway 10, but it's not big and it's not rich. You want to build this, you need some help from the state so that, again, everybody out there can get out there and recreate. Um, you do this, you'd be creating this park and having to set aside that same amount of money um, to replace the extras in the future. I mean, there's just so many logical problems with it. Mm -hmm. The where the idea came from, at least my understanding was, it came from the oh so helpful house bonding chair, who is just like all these folks in Greater Minnesota. They keep asking for money for this, and they're not saving up to pay for things. Again, it's not really having a good understanding of how funding works in Greater Minnesota, but that's a different story. Again, I can see sort of nuggets of why they might want to do this, but then it needs to go down. You know, I mean, it needs to not happen. You know, so I don't normally I, you know, some people are like, well, we can work with them on the language. No, we need to stop it. Okay. That is the message for your legislators that like literally, you know, financially, if we want greater Minnesota to thrive, we need help from the state. We need to continue to recognize that we are one Minnesota. And if you truly believe in one Minnesota, stop this. I, I'm pretty passionate about this. <laughs> well, it's you know, with all of our grants that we go, anything that's going to state, there's already a 20 year agreement that we have to maintain and, yeah. and update and do the yeah. maintenance for 20 years. It's on us, that's yeah. on the entity, not on the state, not yeah. on anything there. So, all that language is already there. So, that's where, like, I even look at it from that standpoint, it just doesn't make sense because we're already maintaining that. Yeah. And most of us, when we come for a grant or yeah. we're looking for bonding, we're already thinking through that implication of all right, what's staffing? How does yeah. this impact staffing? How does this impact our operation budget? So, we're having to increase all of that too. So those unknown cost or those costs that they're yeah. not looking at, they're just looking at what it says to bill, mm -hmm. not the fact that we're going to operate for 20 years without asking you for anything else. Yeah. You can't set up your kids' college funds. You can't feed your kids. Right. That's can I use that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you can't you can't yeah. feed your kids. You can't set up college funds. But yeah, so they may run out of go to college. So it's that kind of like, yeah. yeah, yeah. I like that. I like that. I gotta. Remember that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really good one. I mean, it's like you can't you can't set up a college fund if you can't afford to feed your kids. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what they're asking Gregor and the subject to do. So sorry, I get passionate about some things and I'm very, uh, very, very troubled by this bill. So um do you know how much support it's got a C in right now? Well, to, yeah. the Senate offers hearing it today. She has acknowledged there's problems with it, and I'm just like seriously, I was I, I actually said to her, I was the first person to talk to her about it. They said, I'm asking you not only as a as a lobbyist for you know creator and stuff, but as a St. Paul resident, do you know what this do you know my property taxes? Do you know how much they already went up last year? Um it, it basically it would be fine. Uh, I don't need to pick on a dyna, but it would be fine probably for a dyna. It's terrible for St. Paul. I mean, they're trying to replace the Kellogg Bridge. I mean, probably driven under it and didn't know it was called that. And that's going to be like a $70 um, million dollar, um, uh, project. That So they'd have to set aside another $70 million. Again, mm -hmm. yeah. mind blown in terms of why we think this is a good idea. So I actually just got a text from my colleague about it asking me, who's testifying on the <laughs> So, um, what time is it's three o'clock. That would be in the capital investment um, uh, committee. Okay, so I'm gonna bring it back down. When I get passionate about an issue, I get passionate about an issue. So, um, okay, we're gonna kind of run through some of the other things. There is a lobbying tips here, okay? And some of you may have seen this before, um, because I use it every year. We've made it look prettier this year. Um, 
But so when you're going out and talking to your legislators, you know, something to keep in mind is that um, there's a number of different factors that influence legislators. The fact that and going and talking to your own legislators is the most impactful thing. They are much more likely to listen to someone who is from their community than anyone else, but they are influenced by other, you know, uh, actors. Um, sort of the position of their party or their caucus can have an impact, and then we've seen that more and more. And again, that's why it's really important that people from their district talk to them, because sometimes you need to remind them that, yeah, I know that's what your party says, but, you know, your community needs you. Um, so a number of different factors, you know, inform that. So um, I'm actually, I had a whole bunch of, I wasn't expecting to talk that much on the actual content, so I'm going to jump to the lobbying text, but just a couple things. Um, Really important stuff, always be punctual. Um, always introduce yourself, unless you literally live next door to the legislators. Um, legislators are pretty good at being like, yeah, I recognize you and pretending like they know you when they don't actually know you. So make sure you tell them your name and who you are. Um, be polite and friendly. Um, some legislators are gonna disagree with you, um, but don't be, you know, you gotta be careful. You know, hopefully this won't happen to you guys at all today, but try to avoid partisanship. Um, but also, don't be afraid to state your case, even if there's a pushback. You're going to have a crazy. I've spent a lot of time working with crazy over the years. I know that some of your legislators out there don't like bonding. Don't be afraid to state your case, okay? Just state your case. Um, Stay on topic and avoid small talk. None of you are from Representative David's district, but he is well known for spending the entire 15 minutes talking about anything else with the topic at hand. Never sure if it's deliberate or not, but like he will just, he literally has a hat collection. He'll just start talking about his hats. If they start getting you off topic, bring it back. Well, that, that's great. That reminds me of the park we're trying to build. Bring it back to the park, okay? Um, know your facts and your story. And I think all of you, again, parks and trails are a great story. You can all talk about, you know, that aspect. Um, if there's opposition to the bill, and I honestly, this is less with parks and trails, unless you're, like, going over somebody's land that doesn't want to, it's not as... They're you know out there, but do do be able to talk about who might oppose it. Ask for what you want, whatever you can. Provide a lovely informational you know, handout. That's why we have these for you. Take more than one. Take them home. Bring them to your legislators. Drop them off with your legislators. If you are wandering around today and you don't have an appointment with your legislator, that's okay. Take one of these. Bring it to their LA. Honestly, even if you don't have an appointment, sometimes you can just say, hey, I'm here, I'm from, you know, Wright County, I want to talk to Senator Lucero, can you just slip me in? And sometimes they will, and if not, you know, take this, attach your card, and just say, I was here, please, you know, please support this. Um, one thing I will say again on this bill, particularly for the House, um, the House allows you to have like 25 separate authors. We have four authors on there right now, two from Mankato, one from Rochester, one from, um, Northfield. We can take more legislators on here as the sponsors. So ask them to support it. Ask them, you talk to Waldemar, tell Waldemar he needs to get on this bill. He has carried it for us in the past. Um, Senate Representative Franz carrying it for us now. He should get on this bill. Same with Senator Putnam. It's okay. That's your job. Get him on the bill. <laughs> you too. I, I, I'm going to, I don't mean to pick on crazy. I just, having represented crazy in the past, I know what's on your legislators. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we do have that on here. Well, that was in the Senate bill for us for infrastructure for our parks. I am glad for that. That's right, because you don't have green anymore, right? We still do. Oh, we have met the uh, Senator Aki and Representative Wixon, and they did offer the trip. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Uh, he's a little more willing to do that. Yes. Ex excellent. I'm glad to hear that. Um, informational handout. You know, and the other thing I would say is say thank you. I think sometimes. It's easy to forget that legislators are people too, and uh, telling them thank you again. That's why we, you know, make a show of thanking Senator House Child, and we will be, you know, sending out pictures and you know sharing that because they need to know they're appreciated, and that helps build relationships. So say thank you today. Send a thank you note as a follow up. Always just say thank you. Okay. Um, those are the main tips on lobbying. I'm trying to watch there. Does anyone else have any questions about the whole lobbying thing? And we will be, I will be doing a follow up separate, probably not for another week or two, special bulletin to everybody in terms of this. But, you know, we've got videos on our, our web page about how to do lobbying as well. But if you have questions, ask me now, ask me later. Anyone have questions on lobbying about talking to your legislators today?
Any questions online, Brad? Not seeing any. Okay. Uh, I'd also, uh, this is a tip that Elizabeth mm -hmm. didn't share, but actually has shared with me in the past, is invite your legislators to your local facilities mm -hmm. for a tour. Especially if there's mm -hmm. news out there giving tours already, that would be awesome. So. Yeah. And actually, I would say that the more you can invite your legislators into what you're doing and participate, the better off you are. It's become a lot harder for them to say that the waste of money. If they're, you know, there are all the kids running around and doing the things, you know, it just the more that they can understand what an impact it has on your community, the more likely they are to be supporting you long term. So yes, I should have mentioned that. So mm -hmm. any other? Thanks. Otherwise, we can kind of do the wrap up. Okay. Yeah. So, again, thanks everybody for um, mm -hmm. folks that came all the way here and folks for joining online. Um, just want to give a plug for kind of some things we have coming up for 2024. Um, as you know, we do um, regular forums. We try and do them monthly. Um, and our next forum is coming up on March 25th at 12.30, and that's going to be with the commission talking about um, the legacy grant application process. So be sure to um, tune in for that. Um, and then look for information about our summer meeting um, coming up in July. It will be July 17th, and it's going to be hosted in Elk River at um, Woodland Trail Park. Um, and we're actually co-hosting that meeting with the commission this year. So that should be a good time. We'll talk about um, the details and get those out to you soon. Mm -hmm. um, and then if um, at any time, we always take suggestions for forum topics, but if anybody has any today they wanted to share, I invite you to shout those out. Um, our forums are a really awesome time to just connect as a small network and be really topical in our conversation about um, issues that we all face at varying levels um, when managing parks and trails. So. Uh, sorry, you said May 25th for the March, March 25th. 25th. Okay. Yeah, did I say May? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, okay. I, I thought you said May, I wrote March, I wrote May. <laughs> Um, and then I guess before we close out, if anyone has suggestions for the organization, um, we have a number of board members in the room and online. Um, we take suggestions today or anytime in the future, too. So, well, we want to thank you, especially again. We thank everybody for coming, but always really pleased to see high school students here. I think you know, Senator Health Trail emphasized that we've said it ad nauseum, you know, DNR did, but that is so important to get the young engaged in this because that's how we get things done. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I think it's harder sometimes for a legislator to just like be mean and say no to a high school student than it is for <laughs> like a lot of us. Awesome. Well, thank you again, all of you. We really appreciate it. You coming out from St. Cloud, you coming from St. Cloud. Say Cloud. <laughs> yeah, all the way to Rochester. Uh, so thank you. Don't forget to head up Lake City. So awesome. Uh, please do again if you need extras, all of you take them and um I will be sending this all out to everybody. You can take the legislative ask as well so that you have again, you can leave this with your legislators if you want. Um you don't have to, but at least tell them, you know, this is what we need you to do. Sign on to the bills, blah blah blah. blah. So okay, awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. No, I'm good. Okay. Stop the recording.